Folks, I think we're going to get started. Um, John, our technician, told me if I hold, the, if the people's in, in the back, if your ears start to hurt, it means I have the mic too close. So. <laughs> but, but fortunately, you won't have to listen to me for too long. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our first uh, COIL-sponsored um, talk in our speaker series. Uh, COIL is the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And I saw my two, uh, two other co-directors uh, here, Kyle Peck, where's Kyle, Kyle, and Fred Fonseca. There's Fred, and Cool Camp Police couldn't be with us this afternoon, but he now, <coughs> excuse me, makes up the fourth. So this uh, talk today is sponsored by COIL and University Libraries, and I just want to give a shout out to the group here at the libraries. They are phenomenal to work with and have taken a lot of uh, responsibility for making all of this happen, so I really appreciate their uh, engagement. So it's a pleasure of mine, a true pleasure, to introduce an old friend of mine and a, a friend not, to not a so lot. Old, not so old. Not so old. old. A <laughs> long time. How's yeah, that? A long very, time friend. Yeah. Long time friend and um, very, very active uh, speaker and visionary in the, in the area of online learning, uh, Ray Schroeder. Uh, so I, I did draw up a little bit of notes on you, Ray. So Ray's uh, currently the Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and the director for the Center for Online Learning Research and Service at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Uh, Ray was recognized as an Innovation Fellow for Digital Learning with, with UPSEA, which is University Professional and Continuing Education Association. He serves in that role now. He's received many accolades, awards over the years for his uh, leadership, for his thinking, for his uh, direction in the area of online learning. Very active in Sloan C, which is an international uh, consortium of schools involved in online learning. Uh, Ray also operates a blog since, I think, 2000? Um, is that about which when? Which one? 2001? The, the online techno, techno Oh, news. yeah. That was in 2000. Yeah. And uh, has quite a few uh, followers on that. Uh, it's also been named as one of the most 25 most influential blogs on online learning and technology. And um, in the summer, I think I have this right, of 2011, yes. you offered a MOOC, Indeed. Okay, which Ray's going to share with us. His MOOC was called Edu MOOC, Online Learning Today and Tomorrow. And that's a very interesting topic, but the more interesting thing for us today is how did it go? What did you learn? What was that experience like? And since then, what have you seen as the evolution of this new pedagogical system uh, affecting higher education. So with that, I promised I would stop and Thanks. turn it over to my friend and colleague, Ray Schroeder. Thank you so much, Larry, and it's great to be here. Larry kindly has invited me out uh, to participate in the IELOL program, um, which is uh, a wonderful Sloan Consortium Penn State uh, program for emerging leaders in online learning. And uh, so I'm delighted to be back. And also, uh, we had Larry out uh, gosh, when it was three years ago? Probably three. Yeah, uh, to our campus to talk about uh, instructional design and development. And I do get to travel quite a bit because I've worked a, a good bit with the MOOCs. This, uh, this flight, which was, by the way, uh, Larry, was a little rocky, that prop plane in this, in this weather coming in. But nevertheless, it was my 70th flight this year. And I go all over the U.S. and, and invariably, some of you, this will resonate with, others not. But it's like seeing Kilroy was here, um, for those who are old enough to remember that, when, when, when I was at Oklahoma just two weeks ago, they, well, Larry Reagan was here, you know, and he said, and, and every university I go to, uh, they're quoting Larry to me. We are good friends. In fact, we've presented over, gosh, I suppose about a decade or so that we've made uh, presentations. And this is probably the most exciting time um, in higher education in maybe a century. Uh, big changes, lots of new opportunities. Uh, we have uh, the, the potential to make, uh, to kind of bust loose this iron triangle of access and affordability and quality that we talk about in in higher ed. So um, Larry mentioned the MOOC. I'll, I won't really focus on that in this presentation. I do want to do a couple, say a couple of things to kind of set up before we begin. Um, first, that this is a conversation. It's not one way. So the intent is that 
you jump in with questions, comments, particularly with indignant remarks. So, you know, as we move forward, go ahead and, and jump in so that we can make this interactive. Um, the, the MOOC was great. It was done in 2011 in the summer. And in fact, I had given a, a presentation at eCornucopia, which is a small uh, state of Michigan conference. So we had folks from Michigan State and the University of Michigan who were there too, don't talk to one another. No, no, they do talk to one another but, uh, a bit. But Wright State, Oakland, all the various you know, universities. And I was asked to talk about the open online future of higher education. And uh, commonly, I'm not given such a precise title. Rather, I'm, I'm asked, you know, what would you like to talk about? So I did my research. And when I came back, I, I came back to my massive staff in the center. We, we have three. And, and, and I said, we're going to do a MOOC, in, and we're going to do it in three weeks. We're going to start in three weeks. And that was something that we could do then. And we're going to do it about online learning. And kindly, uh, the Chronicle gave it a little bit of play because MOOCs were new. And, and so we had 2,700 uh, participants enroll from 70 countries. And for that 15 minutes or so, we were the largest MOOC ever uh, produced. And then even at our last session, um, Sebastian, or not Sebastian, it was uh, Seb Schmoller, uh, from the UK was on our one of our panels in the last week of the MOOC. And he publishes the fortnightly out of uh, Oxford. In any event, Seb said, There's, Stanford's got one and they've got 70,000. And even within that hour and a half, he said, no, they've got 90,000. And it turned out 160,000 people signed up for Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig's uh, class on artificial intelligence, their MOOC. And so only by a factor of 80 were they, did they exceed uh, what had been the largest to date. So that, with that context, um, many things have happened in the last year. Uh, we're engaged in a project now um, for which I developed this particular website, which I hope will be a resource to you among others, uh, with the American Council on Education. Um, that just about four weeks ago received uh, a grant from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we were uh, named as a sub-grantee for the research part of the project. Uh, the American Council of Education for many years has reviewed courses that are offered by the military and others and re made recommendations to universities on whether they are credit worthy. Um, and so the question arose, who's going to review MOOCs to see if some MOOCs are credit worthy? And at the same time, the suggestion arose that we might take a look at the pedagogy and practice uh, and run some data analytics in order to get a sense of what seems to be working with this new delivery of education. And so that project is, has just begun. Um, or is just beginning, maybe more accurate. Um, and this presentation is one that I made to the uh, faculty members who uh, review courses at ACE and who will be reviewing MOOCs to make this recommendation. As you can imagine, if uh, MOOCs carry credit or recommendations for credit, that's yet another step in this uh, uh, process of uh, of MOOCs in higher ed. And so uh, I, I also, by the way, uh, commonly uh, my wonderful staff members and I do presentations called PowerPoint lists. And uh, so I don't use PowerPoint wherever I can avoid it. Uh, but uh, but uh, here's a URL because I, I, I would hope to update this site and it might be of value to you at, uh, uh, as you move forward in considering MOOCs and uh, I'll begin to engage with them. Um, really, MIT is the leader, and uh, one has to uh, make note of that once again. Because just over a decade ago, uh, they launched their open courseware project. And uh, as you see in those first 10 years, 100 million people visited those open courses. MIT took the materials from classes, made them available on the web, lectures, 
quizzes in some cases, um, videos, uh, syllabi, uh, et cetera. And the uh, director of edX says MIT's goal for the next decade is to reach a billion minds. And, and nobody's ever said that they're uh, minimalists. They have, a, they have a goal of reaching a billion, largely through MOOCs. And uh, certainly they're off to a pretty good start. How many of us are familiar with Clayton Christensen's concept of disruption? Good. It looks like half of us anyway. Um, it really is that uh, there are certain technologies that uh, Clayton Christensen, a professor at Harvard University, has identified that disrupt an entire industry over time. And commonly, these technologies start, and it's kind of interesting, they start, you know, in the kind of seamy side of, of a business, you know. That's, that's us and, you know, our online classes, Larry. Yeah, where, where it's a little question, you know, is online as good as face-to-face? -face? And, you know, for the longest time, uh, many of the Ivy League schools did not participate in online learning. But as uh, Clayton says, that initially uh, these technologies offer less than what the established market would, would be looking for. And yet they hit on the margin. And just as what we've done with online learning, you know, the adult learner, the, you know, our, our online program, the average age is 35. I wonder the world campus. 34, yeah. So, you know, I mean, we hit this new market segment in providing learning to outstanding learners um, who just happen to be separate from the campus, who could not easily come to the campus. But it describes well, uh, Clayton Christensen describes well what that is. And you offer a package of attributes that are only, uh, uh, only valued in emerging markets remote from and unimportant to, let's say, the liberal arts college, to Harvard, to Brown University, to a lot of those who are looking for students to come to the campus. And this was in 97. And examples were, uh, again, some of us all remember, some, some won't, but anybody remember DEC computers? Yeah, you know, they made mini computers, really big, right? And they made these mini computers, not the mainframes, but that's what was a standard in the industry, and in business used many computers. And, and then along came Apple, and then IBM XT, and PC, and, and really shook up that market. And a number of those, like CDC uh, and NEC, you know, were, were, were shaken by it and, and fell out over time. Then personal computers, uh, we moved to laptops. And so now laptops to tablets are outselling laptops now and we're seeing this this progression of technology disrupting an industry with different providers you know uh, the fire for example the kindle entering where a domain that used to be just apple or or uh, or ibm or or other uh, on uh, rather pc um, providers and uh, the like well the music industry um, I, I know for some of you that we used to have what we called record albums. They were kind of round, you know. They were, about the, they had, they were fragile. and We used to use those, but then along came uh, CDs and, uh, well, cassettes first and then CDs. And, and CDs now have largely given way to downloading, haven't they? I mean, there, there, are only one or, there are only a couple of CD factories in the whole of the U.S. because there are relatively so many fewer CDs that are produced than we had produced in the past. And newspapers, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to talk to quite a few reporters in the last uh, couple of months, and I say, I don't have to explain disruption to you <laughs> in newspapers, right? You know what's happened. Um, the number of newspapers are way down, and, and there are some paper entities that call themselves newspapers, like in Illinois, where, where they have one central site producing newspapers that come out in 20 cities, but not a single local reporter. Uh, not, not really what we, what we used to call newspapers. Well, now may be our time. Now may be the time for higher education. And we, of course, began, and for centuries, uh, 
campus-based learning. We did correspondence classes, but generally we invited students to come to us. And, uh, and then it began, uh, this disruption began with online learning where we said, you know what, we'll, we'll bring our campus to you through online learning. Um, and online learning has spawned now massive open online learning due to a number of variables that interceded because we've been doing online, gosh, you know, a dozen, 15 years. You know, when did the world campus start? 98, and so did, that's when we started too. You know, it just, you look at what's happened and we've been around for a while, but now all of a sudden something's happening. Associated with that and not to be ignored is academic credentialing. And I'll reference that a bit later because there, there are those who are uh, speaking out against the way in which we credential people in this country and uh, what they call a monopoly that colleges and universities have on credentialing. So th let's take a look at what uh, the factors at play. And, and I think probably the, uh, uh, we all recognize the Internet has now become um, international. There are about two and a half billion people who access the Internet. Um, that's a significant portion of the world's population. Um, as it has grown, there's been a rapid proliferation of resources and people are going online around the world, many of them using um, smartphones, in fact, but, but tablets and laptops and desktops and solar powered where they don't have generators and whatnot. Then there's the shrinking cost of, whoop, I don't want to do that, shrinking cost of technologies and the access to technologies. You know, I mentioned the IBM XT, which as I recall, uh, ran us just about $5,000 or $6,000. It, it depended upon whether you believed that you needed a megabyte of memory, one, one of storage, whether you needed a meg of storage on the hard drive. Now, not a gig, not 10 gigs, not a terabyte, but one megabyte, you know, and, and I, we decided we didn't because that meant that we would have 200 books worth of stuff and who could ever fill a meg on a hard drive? I mean, a meg, well, I took a picture of my grandson and it was two megs just yesterday, right? So, I mean, you know, it, things do change. Um, the shrinking cost of the technologies has been very important because it's given us that access. Then the third, and, and this, this is what has put it all in perspective or over the edge, depending upon your perspective on this, it's the Great Recession. The, the result of the recession has been that uh, we have, uh, that, that students are less and less able to afford the greater and greater costs of higher education. And the costs of education have gone up because the uh, funding available to the states has gone down and to the federal government. So our support for federal and state aid to colleges and universities, I mean, we all kind of shudder as we think of what's going to happen to the National Science Foundation. With the fiscal cliff, I think it's an 8% cut, um, and, and that's probably not going to go back. How many of us believe that the state of Pennsylvania is going to give more money to Penn State in coming years and, and restore us to 50% of our operating budget? You know, it, it, those have changed. That change has caused us to raise tuition because our, our costs go up and personnel is most of the costs of a university. And so we've had to raise costs at the same time prospective student income and savings have gone down. And so we now have this increasing gap between uh, the afford well, really based on the affordability of higher ed. And I think we all knew that, but I want to kind of uh, set that uh, in front of us as, as we all consider then uh, what's developed with, uh, with MOOCs. And we talk a lot about massive open online courses. And uh, we're doing another one coming up in February, and there are lots of, or January, on uh, emancipation um, in the U.S. as well as uh, worldwide. Uh, a lot of, you know, and, and the proliferation of these MOOCs is just tremendous. Sometimes 
there are some efforts that are really MOOC-like, even beyond MOOCs in, in more of an open college uh, environment. So I want to give us just a quick look at what's out there right now. And Coursera is, of course, the leader, and it's, it's out there. And they call the, uh, those who have signed up Coursereans. And uh, they, uh, they have now, uh, at this moment, 2,042,240 Coursereans. But I bet that goes up in the next minute as we move forward. They have currently 208 courses. Oh, yeah, here we go, 41. So the, another signed up for, uh, uh, for Coursera. And these courses are courses that really, you know, kind of make sense. It's introduction to astronomy, uh, that's offered by Duke. Uh, um, California Institute of Technology, how drugs affect the brain. Um, uh, our sister campus over in Urbana, uh, heterogeneous genius, uh, uh, parallel programming. When we take a look at those who are offering courses, these are brand names we've heard of. And maybe not like, I mean, there is Ohio State after all. But, uh, but Rice, UPenn, Georgia Tech, Vanderbilt, Stanford, um, and, and on they go. Um, that there are 33 universities currently affiliated with, uh, uh, with Coursera. And if we took a, uh, just a quick glance at that, that broader list, We'd see the University of Florida, a few international ones, Edinburgh, um, London, Melbourne, uh, University of Michigan, Toronto, Virginia, Washington, Wesleyan, et cetera. So these are brand names. Interestingly, some of these have not been engaged in online learning before. Brown University and, uh, uh, and, and others that really hadn't done much in this field but now have jumped on and, of course, a lot of that leveraged by uh, Harvard. I'll note that now we're at 49, right? 2,042,249 Coursereans and it's like the national debt. It just keeps going up. So, uh, so something's a brewing there and it's something that we need to take notice of. Well, interestingly, by the way, one of those uh, early Coursera uh, participants was UC Berkeley, and uh, uh, and they jumped ship, <laughs> and they joined MIT, which uh, today Georgetown joined, and last week Wellesley College, uh, right in Harvard's backyard, right Wellesley joined, and the UT system has joined. Um, they have a, a little different philosophy. They're offering fewer. They are focusing more on research in their classes. Um, and they're also researching the impact and quality of learning in their classes. So if you look at the two of them, Coursera is, the, is a very big early splash with many universities participating. Um, and it is the largest of, of those providing um, online, uh, massive open online classes. We find edX a little more limited, but it's growing, you know, if it adds one a week, it's, it's going to get there uh, as far as matching Coursera and the number of classes. And uh, so when we monitor these, um, it's one of the pieces that, in fact, we're looking at is we've, we've been talking to, uh, to Coursera as well as edX and uh, another provider, unnamed but perhaps obvious, uh, as we uh, as we look at conducting research, and the research that we're going to be doing with these is assessing the classes, creating a, a taxonomy of pedagogy. And many of us may not be in education, so the idea is we're going to take a look at the practices, at the approaches to learning used in an assortment of MOOCs. So kind of a matrix, and then we're going to apply analytics where uh, we have some experience. In fact, Penn State just joined a project that we've been in as well on uh, uh, predictive analytic reporting. Um, and we will gather deep data on students who, who are in these classes and then draw correlations between the, uh, the practices that are used in MOOCs, let's say in a uh, humanities MOOC, um, maybe a, a more quantitative MOOCs, et cetera, and see which ones seem 
to, uh, to lead to greater success. And then at the end of this project, um, what we'll do is take uh, a sampling of students and see how they, uh, how they do in subsequent courses at traditional universities. For example, if you took Calc 1 in a MOOC, how do you do at Calc 2 at an established university? We'll be working with UPCEA. I, I see Wayne is here as a board member of the University Professional and Continuing Ed Association. So we'll be looking at a number of those universities and monitoring students as they move through the process. And this all should be very interesting. Um, again, please interrupt me as you wish. <clears throat> so uh, Google. And, and here I get a little, you know, yeah, here's maybe where you've got to call me on this. I don't know if I get too conspiratorial. Uh, um, but it's interesting that, and, and I did it alphabetically, so we'll get Udacity and Spashed and Thrun, you know, at, in, in just a couple of minutes. But it's interesting that Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig did that very large MOOC. And then Sebastian launched Udacity, which is a very, uh, which has shown significant success in launching MOOCs, particularly in the quantitative area. Um, at the same time this summer, Google launched an online course on search engines. And, it, and in fact, that course is one that uh, Peter Norvig talked about a little bit uh, when they launched the power searching with Google, Norvik, who co-taught with Thron, is also vice president of research at Google. And he said, first of the learning management system, which is open, the course builder learning management system, open source project is an experimental early step for us in the world of online education. And he said, it's a snapshot of an approach that we found useful and an indication of our future direction. Now, if you follow Google, you know that they have scanned in millions of books, right? Hmm. And they've launched an online project. And, and in fact, Sebastian Thrun, great fellow. I, I have high regard for him. But he made a big deal about his giving up his tenure at Stanford. But he does have a day job, which is Google X, director of Google X which is the project developing Google Glass. You'll hear a lot about it outside this topic. Really exciting. We'll hear much more about it after the first of the year. And Peter Norvig co-taught the class. And so if you have a library, and if you have courses, and you have Udacity, and you have Google, which has a history of buying up entities, one wonders if we might at some point see a, a Google University. And then I would ask marketers at my campus and at yours, how do we compete with Google as an entity? And how might they finance that? You know, how does Google finance what they're doing? Someone can tell me. Yeah, that's right. And you have a column, right? So imagine you're teaching a nursing class, right? And we're, we're not talking about trivial numbers. Let's say they're 150,000. And, and uh, so you could sell those white shoes and scrubs and stethoscopes and, and all kinds of things that nurses might buy. And you're only having one faculty member do this, right? And you've got machine grading. Hmm. So, uh, and, and people buying display type ads for 150,000 dedicated students of nursing probably I don't know what we used to call LPNs, but I think there's a, you know, a certain level of nursing, but they might be going for a registered nurse or something like that. Anyway, you get the idea. They're probably, there's, there's a way. You know, and one of the many questions is, how do you make money? How do you break even? How do you finance it? There's something that we might be seeing. Who knows? I mean, Google may not do this, but I can guarantee you if Google does it, Apple's going to do it, and, and that's what's up next because as you know, there's a little enmity, enmity between Apple and Google right now. Um, and uh, Apple, as you know, is one of the most capitalized corporations in the world. In fact, uh, I, I saw a figure now, it may have gone down a little bit, but they, they could buy Amazon, they could buy Google, they could buy Microsoft, and still have 16 billion left over. So, you know, you know, they're in pretty good shape. So that if they found, if Apple found a model, as in an enhanced iTunes U, to 
support to, to turn a profit in higher education, that might be something they would consider. Many questions, and you know, I, I want to, you know, again, saying this may be too conspiratorial, but I think it's worth our thinking about. And, and then, then we can push it aside and say, not now, maybe later, you know, it, it might, it might happen. But we should just be sensitized to this. Um, iTunes U has, at the same time as Google uh, was doing their open course, they beefed up iTunes U. They put in a learning management system, which, of course, they didn't have before. It used to be mostly podcasts, vodcasts, and, and in fact, you had to qualify to be part of iTunes U, as Penn State did, as the University of Illinois did, as you know, we all did. Uh, but, but now it's anybody. And you can launch five classes at no charge using their open system and building a kind of a whole array of courses at iTunes U. Um, Instructure. Instructure <clears throat> has a learning management system. I mentioned LMS. So what's used here now? Angel. Angel. But you had, what did you have before then? OK. So it, it's like that. Instructure is one of the newcomers. They have one called Canvas. Pretty cool system, uh, but a newcomer on the block. And they have seen the opportunity to make money with MOOCs. So they have launched a kind of an exclusive platform for those campuses like the University of Central Florida. And um, I, I note that Brown is, is you know, kind of hedging their bet and, you know, in, in two pools here of MOOCs. Um, so those that use Instructure, uh, Canvas can also offer MOOCs through their system. And that's one of the things that they're doing. So there's another competitor. Um, and just something to be aware of, they, they, they're not nearly as large as Coursera. I'll also note Blackboard because, uh, well, notably, <laughs> we're, we're using it, or will be using it uh, in January. Um, this is Blackboard's free, and I will say at this moment anyway, totally free, they claim it will continue to be free, open uh, learning management system. So for institutions, WebCT was a lot like Blackboard, and unfortunately, maybe Angel became more like Blackboard. And, um, but uh, they have what used to be called Illuminate, is now called Collaborate, unlimited use, free. Launch a class there. You can uh, um, discussion boards. Um, you know, all the, all the pieces. You, you can have journals, you can have wikis, you can have blogs, all of that, along with, you know, tests and time tests, all that stuff. So for those who use Blackboard, um, it's something that, that, um, that has appeal. And in our case, we use Blackboard. So we're going to, we have one that is starting out uh, in uh, January, which is on the emancipation. Uh, proclamation and how we got there and what followed and we're going to look at what emancipation means on different continents as we launch this MOOC. Now Springfield's the home of Abraham Lincoln for those who may not know and so this is kind of a you know a, a natural uh, piece for us that predated that newly released movie by the way uh, the concept did in any event so so we'll be doing that and uh, uh, a MOOC in that case. Well, Khan Academy is a real leader. How many heard of Khan? Yeah, okay. Wow, everybody more about Khan than almost anything else. Tremendous stuff going on there. But what is, and the videos are grand, lots, but they have adaptive learning, which is really pretty exciting. They have the kind of modules that, that you can be quizzed upon so that you can't move to the next level until you show mastery of the prior one. And what Salman Khan says, and I love his quote, uh, he says, you know, when we're teaching our, our children or our nieces and nephews how to ride a bicycle, you know, we put them on and, and we take them out and then they fall. Right? And then you take them out and they fall. And the next day we take them out and they fall. But we don't say, that's okay. That's okay. You get a D, we're doing unicycles now. <laughs> and, and, and his corollary is that maybe that's what we do in higher ed, that maybe we let someone move forward, and if we truly scaffold our learning based on what they've learned before, 
that maybe we're letting students down by not assuring a level of mastery in every course. And that's something that, uh, that they do very well, and they have a huge system that supports that. Well, Ted Ad, how many have seen Ted? Yeah, cool lectures, wonderful stuff. Um, taking a look at Udacity, what Sebastian Thrun's business model is uh, that he takes the top 5% of those uh, who take the test at the end of the course, the top 5%, and offers to be a placement service for them. And the placement service charges 20% of the annual salary from an employer who hires one of the students he represents. And he has shown that he can pay for all of his courses by just representing the top 5% of those students. So if a student makes 100,000 in a job, he gets 20. That cumulatively pays for the whole operation. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be kind of a, it seems a little disconnected to me, but it, it's working for him. It's working for Udacity. Their courses, I don't know if you can see these, but algorithms, intro to computer science, differential equations, programming language, interactive rendering, um, applied cryptography, etc. These tend to be quantitative courses. Uh, and here's my favorite because I get to teach bass fishing. I, I haven't done it yet, but this is for my senior bass fishing class. Udemy is a site where anyone can offer a course and set a fee within certain parameters, but commonly 20 to, well, free to $100 for a course. And then they're all listed, and a, a portion is taken by Udemy, but we see popular courses, Entrepreneur's check, Checklist by uh, Steve Blank, Excel 2010, for those of us who have trouble summing those columns, darn it, and, and, and things like that. So um, just, you know, free photography course. Uh, you know, and, and there's 17,000 signed up. Um, just tons of courses, you know, introduction to Facebook. You know, well, okay. Uh, but uh, some of these have charges, so we see free, we see 99 for the Excel course, 99 for advanced Excel, um, free, free, most of these are free. Do you think my bass fishing should be free? Maybe. Maybe I should be free to start, but, you know, then, then do another one. Well, so that's, you know, a summary of the waterfront right now. Lots going on. There will be lots of failures. There will be some successes. Of course, the key is for us to choose which ones are going to be the success stories and which ones will fail. But just the existence of this whole spectrum of offerings puts pressure on higher education. You know, for the incidental learner, for the, 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 the senior learner, if you will, who's looking for enrichment, you know, they just take them right out of our continuing ed, you know, right out of our extended ed. You know, they're gone. Um, and if a business plan emerges for one or more of these that, that really works, it's going to start cutting at our core. And there are some other factors I want to talk about um, uh, and that, how that happens. So um, pedagogy, and, and, and this uh, I'm going to gloss over, but it's up here for you. It is pedagogy is different because, you know, what we've learned in online learning, I think, you know, Wayne and Larry and, and all of James, you all know, is it's all about interaction, engagement, um, working with the learners, and yet with MOOCs, you have to take a different approach if you have 150,000. It was like Sebastian Thrun said, how many TAs do you need when you teach 150,000 students? Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you really need to work through that whole process because that's something we have not to date researched or confronted. Um, and here are some observations uh, from one that, you know, talking heads don't work. We already knew that. You know, we have this sophisticated term that Larry and I use. We, we call it chunking. 
So we chunk lectures right into little 10, 10 minute pieces and don't run them like this is going on and then 40 minutes I'm talking and nobody's asking questions. So um, here's an early profile uh, in one of the MOOCs. So who's taking MOOCs? Now, you, you can't twist their arms to tell you who they are. And if you did, they might not really give you full, faithful responses. But in machine learning, with about 10% of them responding from the class, only about 14,000, 41% were already professionals in the field. 20% were graduate students, 11% undergrads, some were unemployed, 39% just curious, and three quarters were largely in Brazil, India, Russia. Okay, There is a huge thirst for American education in other countries. And that's something for us to remember as we look at MOOCs, as we look at what we're doing. One of the challenges that we faced in our MOOC, you know, I mean, we. We had a few volunteers, but we scrambled after we started because we didn't expect Portuguese. I mean, well, it's Brazil and all these Portuguese speakers. We had some Spanish speakers for some of the discussion boards, but we needed Portuguese. And then the Eastern Europeans just handled their own. But, but you have to consider that not everything is going to be in English. Certainly the discussion boards won't be. You know, you can use Google uh, or YouTube to auto-translate, you know, some of your videos. You can use other translation services. You know, they've got 54 languages or something that YouTube supports now. Yes, great. For those instances, they just have automatic Well, interestingly, Thrun had 4,000 translators. 4,000. And while we had 70 countries, he had 70 languages. So, you know, and so these people were translating pieces and maintaining and responding, not to every post, but at least, you know, uh, reporting to him, you need to do this or you need to clarify that, and it has to be in these languages. So he got volunteers. How long can we rely on volunteers, especially if we're making money? Yeah, or breaking even. So... But it's a good question, and that's one of the things. I and mean, we considered, probably aren't going to do it, but one of the things we thought about for emancipation was to take our foreign language to offer a one-credit tutorial to foreign language majors to monitor discussions for us. I mean, we couldn't cover every language, but we could cover, you know, the big ones, you know, Chinese and Japanese. And, you know, we, we have those covered in Spanish and, you know, the European languages. Um, anyway, but we decided not to do that, but that's something the university can do, is to marshal those, yes? Yeah, well, it, yeah, China is a big user. There, there are some problems with blockage of internet. And so China, I suspect, this is just one course in, in 2011. And if we're doing it today, maybe we'd get different results. And that's one of the things we're asking the uh, providers where we're doing our research, could you ask, you know, what's their first language? You know, again, you can't force them to answer that, but there's a lot you can do with IP addresses. And then, you know, honestly, here you get in all this stuff. Is it FERPA? Are they really protected by FERPA? They're not paying courses. Are they university? No. But could we look at those IP addresses and see where the requests come from? No, oh, it's that milieu that you're, you're dealing with and trying to sort through. And the attorney's right outside that door, see? So, you know, you're, you're trying to be faithful to your research as well as to, uh, to the laws that that you're working with. Um, so how do we address this? How have MOOC providers addressed some of these issues? Uh, you know, in part, there's peer assessment. What do you think about that? Has anybody taken a class or offered a class with peer assessment? Okay, and what have your experiences been? Someone speak up. Okay, so you get kind of a spotty coverage. Some, okay, yeah, uh, oh, I see. That's we're supposed to mic these. That's yeah. what he was saying. Yes, got it. 
Okay, so the question, so the response was some in peer groups um, respond well and others don't. I always get that, you know, I started teaching in 71 in Urbana campus and whenever I did group projects, someone always said, you know what, I did all the work, Larry didn't do any. Yeah, and, and, and probably, no, that wasn't true. <laughs> But, but but you get the point, yes, exactly right. You get spotty coverage. And yet, if you have enough, maybe you do a peer with nine or ten, ten students each reviewing nine, maybe, or maybe you have an overload and you have to give them a rubric and all. Yes, uh, can you, uh, can we get a mic up here? Yeah, hang on a sec. <clears throat> Uh, the class that I'm associated with was a science writing class at university, introductory science writing class, and we used um, both peer review and calibrated peer review eventually. That takes quite a bit of labor on uh, the instructional side to design um, calibrated papers to teach students how to do peer review in a serious way that respects the scientific knowledge and genre. So, but it, it, we used it and accounted towards other students' grades. And having that calibration factor made it fair, relatively fair. All students were given an opportunity to protest and get their papers graded by mm -hmm. faculty. Very few did. Yeah, and, and so you feel on the whole worked pretty well? It worked pretty well. It took us years to, cal to calibrate yeah, the calibration, right. sure. and to and, but it, it's it's not a um, set it in motion and it's it's let it go free forever. You ha it takes a lot of feed and caring, including yeah. how to teach students how to do um, peer review in a serious way that 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 uh, achieves academic goals. That's right, absolutely. So you got to give them that calibration or rubric or whatever, and and that's important for our humanities. That's important for some case studies. That's important for non-quantitative courses. And that's why it's kind of interesting that Thrun takes the low-hanging fruit, right? You know, I'm going to do statistics. I'm going to do, you know, these kind of yes, no, right, wrong, calculate the answer. You know, you, you don't need the kind of work that, that we look at in the humanities and the arts. Um, so, you know, I have some links to some. But you might look at that. Machine grading is what uh, Sebastian Thrun has used, and others do use, um, and it can be very effective. And we'll, uh, in just a step here, I'll, I'll, I'll share a bit about mastery learning, which I think is an important step that we all need to be aware of. So there also is robo-grading. Um, I, I don't think English profs like that term. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but having a trained computer, an artificially intelligent or expert, more likely you'd call it an expert system, that will grade an essay um, based on certain keywords, titles, uh, authorities, et cetera, uh, that were included in the answers. So those pieces are what are used for this purpose. And, mm, you know, maybe, maybe that works and maybe, uh, maybe it needs a little more development. Um, and again, link, link here to analytics. Analytics, often called big data. I mean, the idea is that, that we collect deep data or detailed data on where students are coming from, what their previous academic experiences are, and then how much time they spend in a, per, a certain part of the course, um, when they took the quiz, how, how soon they took the quiz after the instructional material, did they review it afterwards? Did they review it before? You know, just following clicks and times and, and trying to get into their process to better understand what they're doing. And this has really led to adaptive learning. Um, and this is something I think we all should be aware of because we're going to see universities saying, well, we're a mastery learning university. University of Illinois is not. I mean, if, if you want someone who gets D's and C's, go ahead. You know, if, if you want someone um, who gets B's and C's, Penn State. But if you want mastery learning, Ohio State, Scott, you know, and, and on they go. And the concept is in quantitative matters that you go through and you quiz students on every module in a class. And you don't allow them to move forward without mastery. So a student takes the material but does not move forward 
until they achieve 90, 95%, or 100%, wherever you set that. So a student gets a wrong answer, they're taken back, and in systems like Newton and LoudCloud uh, learning engines, they're taken back to that material in maybe a different learning style, maybe auditory rather than verbal. Maybe uh, uh, they give them case studies instead of a simple narrative. Uh, and, try, and then over time, learn what seems to work best for the student. So the student who has finished the class uh, has demonstrated mastery in each of the modules in that class. You know, another of the Bill and Melinda Gates projects that we're engaged in is called Portmont College. And um, some others I, I know are going to participate in this as well. And their concept is that they are admitting students um, based on tenacity and grit. So they have an assessment, not on, and they have them in a boot camp, if you will, a virtual boot camp. They're not looking at test scores. They're not looking at grade point. They say that the skills required to, in this case, get an associate's degree are tenacity, grit. These are the students who stay up till 2 a.m. and work on the project and don't give up. And uh, so they demonstrate it in this first entry camp, and then they move them forward using mastery learning. So then those students complete an associate's, and then we'll be looking at degree completion um, in a way in which they can, um, they can complete the degree, but you know coming in that they've achieved mastery, if you will. So I, I see that this is a movement that's moving forward, and it, it, it's coming out of some of the research and some of the practice of MOOCs that came from machine grading, from the use of uh, data analytics. And so uh, I have some uh, links to that. So how do these things, you know, sustain themselves? And that, that really is, of course, a key question. Um, right now, we're, we're kind of, you know, one sees a lot of talk about certification fees. And I think I have, uh, we have seen that, interestingly, with Udacity and the Colorado State University Global Campus. Um, Udacity offered a course which essentially was an intro computer science, but they did it under the premise of building a search engine. I wonder why, being Sebastian Thrun and Google. But anyway, they, uh, the Colorado State University Computer Science Department reviewed the class and said, you know, it's worthy of three credit hours. And so they contracted, that is Udacity, contracted with Pearson, a big company in our field, uh, view which uh, does testing all over the country and they do a proctored exam for this course so the students walk in you have to show a photo ID and then you sit in front of a proctor and you take the test those that pat that and you have to pay $89 for the test everything else is free up to that point you pay $89 Colorado State says show us your certificate that you passed in a Pearson site, and, and we'll transfer three credit hours. We'll give you three credit hours. Now, I may be wrong, but I think that this university charges more than $30 a credit hour. I know ours does. And so this is a little issue here as far as uh, how far this will go. Now, that was kind of a loss leader. Let's bring some students in, I'm sure. But nevertheless, for a certification fee, students might get a credential. And you know, I'll talk about badges in a moment. All of this, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get your hands around this because there's so much going on that's tangential. So uh, Udacity, I explained the, the employment agency. Advertising within the class, we talked about that. Deconstructing MOOCs, that's something that uh, is Coursera doing with community colleges. Anybody follow that? Antioch and uh, what they're doing, what they want to do is take some courses and charge community colleges for some of the content. Now, even though a student can take the whole course for free, Coursera and, or the and jointly the institution that offers it owns that material. And so they want to charge community colleges to use a portion of that material 
in their classes and um, saying that you know this will save community colleges time particularly in gen ed in these very large volume classes so that could be a revenue generator for some institutions and for Coursera well there are many creative people <laughs> working on this you know far more creative yes Oh, good. There's so many things that have gone through that are interesting. But um, a lot of people seem to subscribe to the theory that they're only put out by universities like Harvard and Yale, MIT, et cetera, in order to, in the future, monetize them. How do you feel about that? Um, I think that there certainly is a keen interest in monetizing them. Keen interest. Maybe not immediately the only reason. I would say another factor is simply the publicity. You know, you announce that you've joined Coursera. You're on CNN. What would, as someone said um, NBC Today did something on MOOCs this morning. You know, I mean, you're, you're an NPR. You're, you get all this publicity, and you're just teaching a class you've already taught. And, you know, I mean, yeah, it takes some work, but you're, you're putting it into their learning management system. So I think that there's, there's the publicity a pr part of it that's part of it. Also, I think, and this is really good. I mean, your question is, what's the motivation? And, and are they doing it for money? I think ultimately, um, I think many are doing it for money. I think that um, many are doing it to be associated with, you know, let's take edX, for example. You know, I think it was a UT system, pretty cool that they were able to get their with uh, Harvard and uh, MIT and Wellesley, you know, same with Georgetown. I mean, you don't immediately put those all together, right? Um, so there's, you know, this, this kind of spin by association that takes place. But ultimately, there has to be a financial model. And the, the large contract that Coursera has, at least an earlier version, the University of Michigan's version, is available on the web. And, and they talk about some possibilities. You know, I mean, you, but it, it's early. And, and what might have been talked about as a possibility six weeks ago may be superseded by some new idea of some really creative person as to how this could be monetized. Ray, I forgot to mention we have about 40 people online oh, with us oh, cool. watching you through MediaSite. Um, a question from uh, Jerry is asking about the, the issues of academic integrity, uh, cheating, uh, unapproved collaboration, uh, and so forth. And um, there's the, the idea or the reputation they're developing that cheating was rampant and blatant. Well, um, cheating and cheating. Okay. So, if, if, you're not, if you're taking a, 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 a MOOC not for credit and not intending to get credit, well, then you probably don't look at it as cheating. You, we, we call that collaboration. <laughs> no. But, but if, you're, if you're looking for credit, and then really you see what we're talking about, the kind of model that, uh, that Colorado State used with Udacity, that is, and that's what so many of us have used over the last 15 years in, in uh, online learning. That is, a student has to identify themselves. You know, we talk about verification and identification. You know, we're, we're familiar with these terms. So you have to verify who the student is, and the student then has to go through a process in the end to get credit, whether it is to write an original essay or something, and there has to be a way to validate that. And I think... Um, so certainly we'll see some of that, uh, but we see that currently with online learning and we go through it, all of those steps, and I think we're, we're kind of migrating to the point, you know, there's, uh, what is it, ProctorU and, and those other services that are webcam proctors, I don't know, um, you know, and some of them that I think can work well. Um, and so there are a lot of solutions to that. But I think that's a good question. And, and we also have this whole, you know, this, this spectrum of learners. Some, like, you know, given the time, I might take something on master gardening. You know, I might be interested in something like that. Larry's, that's one you can teach. Or ornithology, 
or, or something like that. I might be interested, you know, in doing that, but really as personal enrichment and uh, um, not so much in transferring it for credit. But the yeah, here's Antioch and the, the global, global campus also available. Well, so now, I, you know, I'm going to try to provoke you a little bit. And, you know, I, I haven't done that, if I haven't done that already. So here we go. Uh, this uh, came out, uh, let's see, on, uh, uh, in October. It was a column by Salman Khan, you know, of Khan Academy, um, on CNN. And, he's, and he uh, said, let's try a thought experiment. What if we were to separate teaching from credentialing at universities? He said, you know, there are lots of ways to learn. And when we look at America now, you know, oh, we might have credit for prior learning or, you know, there are a couple of different terms that are used for that. But we may not fairly represent the learning that people take place. For example, you know, Springfield, of course, the capital of Illinois, there's a bit of learning. And, uh, um, you know, years ago when I uh, taught on-campus classes, uh, we would have state senators take classes, including Illinois government. And, and they were pretty well versed in Illinois government. Probably didn't have to take the class. Possibly in some of them could even have taught the class. And, and so maybe we ought to have recognized some of their learning. But anyway, so Khan says, look, it, there are lots of ways. You can go out on the web, you know, and, and talking about Abraham Lincoln, right? He sat by the fireplace and he read those books, you know. Anyway, you know, you get the idea that you can self-teach some things. Um, so he says, with our hypothetical assessments, let's, what, what if we gave, we separated the two? As Penn State, you're great at teaching. You should teach. You shouldn't be allowed to offer baccalaureates or masters or doctorates or give certificates. University of Illinois, no, nah, no, nah, not you either. We should have a separate entity assessing credentials that are amassed by students from multiple sources. Well, this makes me very uncomfortable. It, you know, I mean, if, if one were to do as Salman Khan suggests and separate the two, which are inherently wed together in our culture and our society, that would have a damaging effect on colleges and universities. And yet, there are some people, and he's not the only one, who, who suggests that. They say, in short, make the credentials that most students and parents need cheaper, because they won't have to pay our tuition, right? Since it is an assessment that is not predicated on seat time. Well, yeah, and we're all trying to be more reasonable about the way in which we give those credentials. College would become uh, optional, even for students pursuing prestigious career tracks. Hmm. Well, there's uh, an association called CHIA. It's a, I think it's, what is it, the Council of Higher Education Accreditation. Judith Eaton, you know, uh, chairs that, has for many years. Um, and as she looks at accreditation, this is a, a column that she sent out early in November, is my recollection. Yeah, November 4th. Oh, no, oh, I, I, I went too far. Um, I guess it, it lists an October date. Yeah, Halloween. Hmm. Um, so we're talking about innovation in education, refreshing change. Um, most conspicuous are MOOCs. She says, what is a MOOC experience worth to a student? Students can receive an acknowledgement. They can get badges. I'll talk about that in a minute. That affirm mastery. The Mozilla Foundation has constructed that platform, et cetera. UC Berkeley exploring award of transfer of credit to California Community College students who enroll in their MOOCs. So, and, and, and she even mentions the project that the Gates Project, the Council on Adult and Experiential Learning of the American Council on Education. Uh, looking at MOOC experiences. And so that's a concern. You know, we're all uh, accredited by North Central Association Higher Learning Commission, which uh, is the largest of the regional accreditors. And they uphold rules that are put in place by the U.S. Department of Education, among other things. And um, so the question that Judith Eaton is asking on behalf of all of, how many accrediting associations? Are there seven? 
Anybody know? Six or seven, something like that. You know, there's northeast and western and, you know. Anyway, uh, on behalf of all of them is what are we going to do with accreditation? And then there's the whole concept of badges. How many are familiar with badges? Oh, geez, everybody, everybody. Yeah, you all know all this stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, and of course we've seen the Microsoft Certified Engineer, right, or a Cisco Networking Specialist, you know, a little bug, if you will, a little JPEG, a photo, a GIF that's put on their resume. Well, what's kind of neat, or uh, interesting at least, is that uh, the, and let's see if I've got that down here, I don't, okay, that the Mozilla, uh, that Mozilla received a grant from the MacArthur Foundation, I'm going to make you dizzy here. Hang on. Don't look at the screen while I zip by here. I don't want to be in degree. Here we are. Okay, I'm back to where I was. So I have a great graphic, but it's on another website. Um, the Mozilla Foundation, uh, or the Mozilla, uh, MacArthur Foundation gave, the Mo gave Mozilla, you know, that's um, Firefox, right, browser, gave them money to create a secure site to hold badges. So Penn State... Does Penn State offer any badges? Do we know? Not yeah. officially. Okay. Not officially. Not officially. So we don't want to talk, the provost in the room, we don't want to we talk have, about them. Okay. There are a lot of people interested in doing that. Yeah. And some are uh, working with Purdue's passport system as a prototype. Oh, yeah. So there, and there, there are people, there have been meetings with people from different groups together talking about what a Penn State system might look like. But we're still exploring and thinking about that. Yeah, we are too. But, I, but a lot of appeal, particularly in the corporate environment. Um, to certify skills, particularly, or levels of uh, knowledge or understanding within courses, maybe in a micro level, maybe one could qualify, or maybe, you know, like a mini certificate. There are many ways you could approach that. But anyway, giving these credentials, let me relay a, a, an experience from last April where Wayne and I uh, were in Phoenix at the invitation of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at a small gathering. I think there were about 30 of us from uh, from various colleges and universities. And uh, they brought in some folks. I, I recall one was the president or vice president of the American Manufacturing Association and some other kind of big industry groups. And uh, we were talking about, you know, some projects Gates was interested in, but this was kind of a diversion, if you will, Maybe, but not really. <laughs> it was to give us a little reality. And uh, uh, so these folks had a great panel, and, you know, they talked a little about their associations. And so we asked, well, what are you looking for in our graduates? And we're thinking, well, creative thinking, critical thinking, you know, problem solving. I mean, you know, and, and instead, what I heard them say, .NET programmers, cost accounting, they listed skills as if these were commodities. And instead of the breadth of education that I, from a liberal arts baccalaureate, low that uh, half a century ago, uh, had, um, that it wasn't that at all. They were looking at people that kind of move in and out. And especially at entry level, you know, from baccalaureates, and they weren't looking so much at people who moved up within corporations. And I think we see that in industry today that, that you know, I've forgotten the stats, but, you know, the average graduate today will hold 22 jobs, you know, in their career. And here I am 41 and a half years later still working for the University of Illinois. So, you know, I'm a kind of a dinosaur. There won't be many of those probably in the future. It's going to be much more look based on skills and you either upgrade or you're out and you go to someplace else. And I think that having these kinds of badges, I think, are an important piece of the continuing education that students need, that employers are asking for. You know, no longer, you know, I grew up in the 50s and I was born in the end of the 40s. And back then people would get a high school diploma or, if they're lucky, a college degree, and that was it. You wouldn't, your, your shadow wouldn't darken the doorway of a classroom again, and you'd work 35 years and you'd retire. Um, but now, in part 
driven by technology across so many industries, we need uh, professional development throughout our careers. And that's an important piece, I think, of what we do. And I think that's an important piece of what MOOCs will do for us in the future. You see, we're caught in this old routine. You know, when, when forgive me here for saying, because I'm old communication faculty member, uh, communication technology, but when radio came out, it replicated newspapers. And it just kind of did, you know, in the news piece, or, and, and, and they might do like a vaudeville act, but it would be from the stage. And when television came out, well, it was like radio in front of a camera, right? And as we move through the media, that's what happened. What are we doing with MOOCs? Well, we're taking what's been taught on campus and we're replicating it. And that may not be the best idea. What we want to do is look at this medium, look at the reach, look at the potential and say, what can we do best? If we can reach 150,000 people, do we really want to teach them, you know, my D in art history it lives with me these decades later. And maybe art history is what we want, but maybe it's not. It was boring to me then. Forgive me, again, maybe not to you. But, uh, but maybe we want to Maybe we want to pull together people from all over the world or across the country to give the very latest update to a, law, a broad swath of an industry or of a field or even of an avocation um, using this technology because that's what it does very well. Well, I, when I had read this first, I had, uh, I had read this last part, this company called DeGreed. And, and I read greed, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, come on up. Yeah. Um, only because we're running uh, a little bit short on time. Okay. I was wondering if, I mean, you've done a really great job about the yeah. big, big, big picture. Ask questions. And I think um, a lot of us in this room understand some of the concepts like, you know, the basics of Coursera and some of the yeah. history and things. What I don't think any of us have are your personal experiences designing a course, sure. what went wrong, the good, the bad, the ugly, and I was wondering if you could Spend some time on that. I will. Okay. So quickly, just what DeGreed is doing, and I'll do that briefly. It is, it's a startup that is crowd-funded, and it is collecting all kinds of credentials across um, academe, as well as badges, as well as informal credentials into a portfolio for students or persons to share with the world. And the concept is that DeGreed will offer you um, this kind of uh, um, portfolio of what you've learned, basically an e-portfolio. Well, you know, when we look at, um, let's see, I think I've got this. What did I learn? Oh, let's see. I'm wondering if I did this. Um, is there such a thing? No, edumooc.blogspot.com probably is what it was. Um, what I did was I blogged uh, directing this, which gave my observations. And uh, let's see if we've got it here. All right, well, I'll play with that. And, oh, blogspot. Yes, it is blogspot. Thank you. Um, Oh, here's something. Yeah, okay. So this started uh, in, you know, if those who are interested, who are looking at launching MOOCs, here I've got uh, multiple postings of the good, bad, and ugly of, uh, of launching a MOOC and dealing with languages, dealing with, uh, you see, we had people, who, so when you do a MOOC, there are people all over the world. So, uh, like those in Christchurch, New Zealand, they gathered at the McDonald's, free Wi-Fi, you know. So they gathered at the McDonald's in Christchurch, New Zealand, around their cheeseburgers, and they listened to our panel discussions 12 hours later because, of course, they're on the other side of the earth. Um, so they listened to what we had recorded, and we had uh, a weekly panel of different experts on different aspects of online learning, and they would talk about it and gather. Others did 
Google Hangouts, which were brand new in the summer of 2011, and they would shred us apart, you know, what our experts had said because their perspectives were better or different or otherwise. And we had those that were faculty members in Europe who had access to Moodle, and so they created their own Moodles. And now, uh, since all the materials for EDU MOOC are still there, it, it's open courseware. So we, I get requests all the time. It, you just say, okay, okay, okay. And thousands of students are taking this EDU MOOC or this course about open or about online learning um, at other universities, and they're charging credit for it, right? They're charging, you know, for three credit hours. But they've got recordings of Larry Reagan and I don't know that we had Wayne, but we had, you know, I don't know, Bruce Shalhou and you know, lots of leaders in online learning in these. And we had readings and weekly readings and, and whatnot. So, uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that. I, you know, some of these are a little uh, uh, dark. Um, yeah, so uh, y anyway, you can look through the, the blog, which will give you much more information about it. I've also put up at this site uh, just kind of a preliminary list. If you're thinking about doing a MOOC, these are things you should not forget. And uh, beginning with always, here's communication coming back, always identify your audience. Know whom you're trying to reach. Don't just throw it out there. Who's your target? These are your target audience. I Keep them in your mind every day that you teach a class or that you do a MOOC. And then identify the outcomes. What I mean, this is instructional design, right? Yeah. And then identify what are the outcomes that these people should have from this MOOC and other objectives that you might have. It might provide publicity. It might provide recruitment for your institution. These are positives, and so factor those in as well. Determine when, what the time frame is. Consider, you know, and on you go. Should you give a badge? Should you give a certificate? Should you give credit? Should you offer it dual, dual mode? Should it be for credit at Penn State? Those who are here take emancipation and pay tuition, and those who are not get it for free. But those who are here get the closed discussion board and the responses from faculty members, and maybe they help moderate discussion boards. I mean, you know, there are no rules yet. Let me say that. There are no rules doesn't have to be eight weeks, 16 weeks. There are no rules. So here you are with an educational opportunity. Just, you know, what a glorious moment. We don't get these too often in higher ed, every couple of centuries, yeah. So Ray, if you were to repeat, let's say this summer, this same MOOC, okay, the same experience, so you're not regenerating content right. and such, what's one thing that you would do differently than you did the first time? Well, certainly I would, I would run it and, and not as an advertisement, but I would run it through a learning management system, in our case, through course sites. At this point, nothing was available. Um, a, a MOOC learning management system wasn't out there. Because when you're trying to enroll 2,700 in just two weeks, it's really hard when you only have three staff members and we all have full-time jobs. So I would use an LMS. Um, I think that that probably would be the first thing that I would do differently. I would also promote it in other countries and other languages. And I would take more than three weeks to plan it, by the way. Yeah, okay. Got it, got it, you know. That, that really, you ought to look a semester in advance in order to, to move forward. Um, I think the platform is important. I think volunteer and paid staff at this point is important. Um, I would have a graded component at the end for those who want a certificate or a badge. And there are so many ways you can do that that are, you know, I mean, you can contract with Pearson, or there are lots of other proctoring uh, consortia that you could use uh, to provide some end credential for those. And then, you know, I think you want to decide, do you want to make it open courseware, which is what we did. Um, you know, philosophically, I believe that's a good thing to do um, after it's over to make it available to the world. If your focus is monetizing, as been asked, then that may not be a good thing. Yeah, so it's time to see. I think we have a couple of minutes here yet. 
if, to, for me to answer any questions. Did you any other questions this come up? Ninety minutes or sixty minutes, Larry? Uh, we've got about uh, about eight or nine minutes. Oh, okay, good. Yep. So we've got a little time. Okay. Yep. Terry. Thank you. I was just curious. Uh, what are some of the legal uh, concerns, FERPA concerns, in regard to offering a MOOC to twenty thousand students right. around the world? There are. There's. There's uh, certainly FERPA. There's, um, you know, uh, access, ADA concerns. All of these. Now the question is, and and I don't know the answer. If you're not offering it for credit, is it FERPA, right? It, you know, I, I don't know. Is, or, or is it a lecture series the university offers? I, you know, attorneys will guide you in that regard. Um, we, you know, in, in doing the MOOC, we just asked, would you? But we didn't premise. The only thing they had to give us was an email address so we could put them into our, because uh, uh, we used uh, Google, uh, oh, I don't know, Google Groups. Because again, we didn't have a learning management system. Uh, you know, they had to give us something to put in there so then they could be invited and then they could become a member of it. But we asked them what city, you know, would you tell us what city you live in and whether you're affiliated with the college or university? And some did, most did, 90 percent did, but some didn't. And uh, it was helpful to us to be able to look at all the different countries and, you know, and the like. As far as ADA, um, I think we probably all are incumbent uh, to provide access in that way. So uh, mostly our materials were print, you know, when, here, I'll go to the site. It's not necessarily uh, beautiful. While Ray's doing that, can yeah. I just take a survey? How many people in the room have participated in a MOOC of some sort? About three quarters. Okay, good, thank you. Just curious. Did you all pass? Well, no, no, no. Here's the morning question. Did you all complete? How many of those completed? Seriously. Uh, about three of you. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, our site was all through open resources. So we used, you know, Google Groups and Wiki Spaces and all these various uh, tools. Uh, and in each week, we put up resources. Uh, here's one, for example, Karen Swan let us on what the research tells us. So she has, uh, uh, you know, we identified the moderator and a couple, Phil Ice, Ben Arbaugh, and then uh, and we had about 25 readings for each week uh, for, for people to use. And we took questions via Twitter, right, because, again, free and another open resource. Um, let's see, Larry, where did, oh, I, we had you in. I think I was on with Bruce. Yeah, but um, earlier uh, to the program, uh, Ray and I were speaking of the idea of reusing already existing resources. The part of to be smart about this is to identify uh, a variety of different input sources that you might consider importing into a MOOC-like environment. For example, do you already have videos existing? Do you already have some print resources and so forth? <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to ask a question. It's going to drive you crazy, but um, I'm a librarian. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you just mentioned <coughs> linking to articles. Only open online articles. Okay, so the question is, is in today's environment, in a course like this, can students do a course and get three credits or its equivalent badge or however you want to define it without ever using licensed information resources? And if so, what does that mean? Well, uh, good question. Um, you know, you can do that in statistics if you right. wrote the textbook. But I'm talking about a course but where you specifically link to resources. I understand there's yeah. lots of courses that don't need right. library resources, lab courses, and whatnot. But yeah. when you're linking to those things, is well, and I, I would ask you more questions like, was that fair to those academics who did that work? I mean, there's it just raises a well, whole bunch of questions. You know, part of the thing, it, you know, we've been... Uh, well, uh, several of us in this room uh, collaborated on uh, a book, right? And uh, uh, we did the writing last year, and and everything was due January first, and and the book is going to come out April. in April, so a year plus. If we're talking online learning, honestly, you know, 
things change. I mean, you can't be 15 months late. Well, we didn't, but I mean, will we? Because it's 15 months old, it was a topic that, you know, so in this topic, it's very timely. But, for example, on the Emancipation Proclamation, well, the federal legislation, all that stuff, that's, you know, freely available. But there's a book that the two faculty members who are teaching this class, well, it costs $8. So the question is, it's a MOOC, and you can recommend it that the students buy it, but otherwise. That's it. And then, then the question is, many libraries, I've forgotten the, the associations, but there are some libraries. Gosh, I, I can't remember. Yeah, OK. So there are some things that, that might be accessible but to, to many of the students. But that's one of the things we've gone through with the faculty members. And that's, you know, that's the question. I think you know, the question that we face now about scientific publications you know, Elsevier and all of those, are those proprietary or not? Yes, they are. Question is, should they be? If they accept federal money, should they be? And if they accept state money, should they be? And, you know, we can go through all this. One who can speak much better to that, uh, one of our panelists, Cable Green, some of you probably know Cable, who's the Education Director at Creative Commons. So I think we might have time for just one more here, Ray. Um, so you designed your class with all open resources, and a lot yeah. of the big name MOOCs that you discussed um, don't give any information about their platform or their learning management system. So if you had a choice to do this in your ideal world with your course to be redone coming up, yeah. what platform and learning management system would you choose? I would use, and but but here I'll get over to this side. I would use course sites, but not saying that you should. It's because my university, all three of our campuses use Blackboard. So for any of our faculty members who are part of it, they're familiar with that LMS. Inside out, we support it, we know it. That's why we would go that way. But Apple has a learning management system. Google has a learning management system. Moodle is open source. You know, One of the key issues that you face is how do you enroll these students? without big in, building a big front end for, you know, 50,000 students. So that's, you know, that's why I looked at course sites, because it has it built in. There's people go there, and it's transparent to me. I can look at the list of the names, whatever name they give, which may not be their own, you know. Uh, I can look at the list. So that's pretty much that. But I'm available, you know, I, afterwards we want to talk a little bit, and also if, um, you know, I, I'll work more on this site. Let me give uh, a quick plug, not advertising. By the way, there's no advertising, no spam, no follow-up ever. But I have five daily blogs that I produce, one on online learning, one on educational technology, one on technology news. And then if you want to start the day with a downer about how many people have been laid off at Louisiana State, the recession realities is a good way to do that. There are three items in each blog, each case linking to a publicly available article um, and just raising it to your attention. So, um, and then the fifth one, well, I don't have it. This site is anyway. Um, I do. Where do I have it? Oh, I have it up in this left column someplace, uh, which is uh, the UPSEA blog, the University Professional and Continuing Ed Association blog. So that's a way you can keep up with it. Because I think, you know, I, I've made this my obsession for now. And if, if you, too, are interested in seeing what's going on, you can just look at the blog. They all feed burner for free. No advertising. Don't keep the names. It's up to you. Or you can just look on the web, visit it occasionally, and you'll see what kinds of things, like Georgetown joining Coursera today. Thank you, Ray. I'm going to wrap up here in a second. I just want to mention to you another uh, event sponsored by COIL. Uh, we're, doing, we're going to be doing two types of programs initially through the center. Uh, one is going to be called the COIL Speaker Series, the Fisher Speaker Series, which will kick off in um, January, February time frame. We're working on our first speaker for that. Um, Ray is our first Coil Fisher speaker, so, so thank you for a great, great kickoff. Uh, we'll you. also be doing something called Coil Conversations, 
Uh, these are done through Adobe Connect. The next one coming up is with Bill Sams. Bill was instrumental in creating the Epic 2020 yeah. video, if you've had an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Coy, uh, he's, uh, Bill will be joining us on, uh, through Adobe Connect. The website is meeting.psu.edu. You all know that. Slash coil, C O I L, um, on uh, the 12th of uh, the 18th, I'm sorry, the 18th of December from 4 to 5 p.m. And Kyle Peck will be moderating that for us. So, so if I put in questions, you're going to have him? Absolutely. I, I'd love to ask yeah. him. Yeah. He's a brilliant fellow, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. I He's really great. like that. Uh, we also have a Yammer group now, so I know a lot of you are in Yammer, so find a coil at PSU in Yammer. Join us. Uh, we try to post multiple postings there per day. Uh, with that, let me wrap up. Thank you all for taking your time this afternoon to join us on a, a perfectly clear topic. <laughs> uh, Ray, thank you so much for taking time to join us and sharing your expertise with us, and, and uh, welcome to Penn State. Thank you. Appreciate it.